I was going to make this video back in March, but then life happened, as it did with most of you, I'm sure. It was early February of 2020, and I was almost finishing going over the audio survey of my areas of interest from last season, when I noticed a very interesting trend. So I started writing for this video, but then life happened again, and there's just a mountain of data to go through, so this video is way past deadline, and for that I apologize. This is going to be a summary of the 2019 audio survey of my areas of study. I'm not always going to do a summary at the end of every season, but in this case, I need to share what I found. I think it's significant to a nagging question that we all have about these creatures. I can promise you there's a very solid and straightforward point to be drawn from what I found as it takes the anecdotal discussion we've all been having about the difficulties with being able to capture Sasquatch on video and gives it tooth and claw. So in each of these nights that each one of these files represents, there are three separate 12 to 15 hour recordings contained within. These audio files were separated into two groups. In group one, was the single audio file that was placed alongside my only video camera. And in group two were the files from my other two audio recorders by themselves. Thankfully, I had the presence of mind to label the audio file that was placed alongside the video with the letter V in the title as seen here. That's important because when it's January and I'm reviewing audio from last season, I would have absolutely no idea which one of the three audio recorders had the video alongside it if it weren't for the V in the title. These Group 1 audio files that were alongside the video will be referred to as Audio V files for the purposes of this discussion. So the point I was referring to is this. When evaluating the audio files from last year, I'm hearing almost nothing out of the ordinary, nothing noteworthy, nothing worth putting to video or otherwise on the audio V recorders. This is perplexing because out of 241 total audio captures for the season, only one happened on an audio V recorder. Out of 759 total hours of audio, the audio V files comprised 254 hours for the season or 33% of that 759 hour total. So those audio V files should have contained roughly 33% of the season's captures, right? Via the central limit theorem, Google it if you're interested, 33% or around 80 captures of the 241 seasonal total is what it should have been. Do you see the huge discrepancy between those numbers? and the final tally for the other two recorders that were by themselves. The audio only file tally was 505 hours and 240 unknown or significant audio captures. 505 hours only comprises 66% of that 759 total hour for the season's audio. So they should be expected to catch 66% of the season's 241 captures, right? Nope. They caught all but one. 99.58%. The only variable that was different in the two groups was the presence of the video camera in the audio V files. The video was randomly placed with different audio recorders in eight different locations throughout North Ross, Wisconsin, throughout the survey that lasted from July to the end of October. Moreover than that, like I stated at the beginning, I never noticed the trend or even thought about testing for this when setting the audio and video out last season. Nor did the thought cross my mind when going over the files this winter. I was just happy to get a couple of jaw droppers on tape. I really didn't think I'd get that many. If I knew I was going to pile that many significant audio captures up when starting the season, it may have crossed my mind. Only because the larger the sample, the easier it is to draw correlational trends from. 
The video camera I used was an Ion Air Pro. They are cheap, rechargeable HD audio cameras. I liked their compact design. They fit into my hiding spots nicely, with room for my audio recorder to spare. They also record in 1080, which is nice. The 29 frames per second is a little slow, and it gets a little choppy if I move the camera around at all. But if it's left still to record, it does just fine. It emits no IR beam, no trigger to turn it on. When I start it, it just rolls until the battery dies, which is around two and one half hours. So I like to set it out when there's still about three hours of daylight left, pointing it east for best results. This video camera would always be in the same birch bark tube as one of my audio recorders when deployed. I never kept the video in the same location. I would change it around. There were only eight different locations used all year long, and the video had been randomly placed with the audio in all eight locations more than a few times. I don't have the exact data for that, but the video had been everywhere. Yet for some reason, even when the video ran out of battery power and thusly stopped recording, they still avoided the area like the plague in terms of audio. All of these captures are inextricably tied to my experience and knowledge of the natural world. I know full well that this is going to be the soft underbelly that the skeptics in the mainstream will attack first. So let's talk about that subjective underbelly for a minute here. The skeptics are right. There's really no getting away from it. These captures are mere subjective unknowns as deemed through my knowledge and perception of the natural world. I fully concede that, but humor me for a second here. Given these 241 speculative captures have been claimed by yours truly, shouldn't they occur at regular intervals if the presence of the video camera variable was meaningless? My knowledge and experience that I draw from to filter these sounds remains relatively constant throughout the season. I mean, I'm the only one listening to these recordings, and I'm not changing anything from when I listen to a regular audio file as opposed to an audio V file. Since these subjective captures are inextricably tied to my knowledge of what sounds can be heard in the nighttime woods of northern Wisconsin, the rate at which I discover these unknown sounds should be somewhat regular and predictable, given a large enough sample size, right? I would submit that 759 hours qualifies. If these unknown sounds can be seen as regular and predictable in occurrence, then shouldn't the audio V recorders have captured the same percentage of captures as per the percentage of time they spent in the field? Why did they only capture one for the whole season? Less than 1%. I'll tell you why. It's because these beings, at least here in northern Wisconsin, avoid video cameras. Not only do they avoid being filmed on one, they are silent when anywhere near them, or they just vacate the area entirely. I'll tell you what else I'm getting out of all of this. I'm getting a lot of validation for how I determine the sound that I hear is either a known sound or otherwise. I can say that because of the giant and significant deviation in the actual results as compared to the expected 33%. I mean, I'm still hearing crows, owls, coyotes, foxes, bears, deer, grouse, mice, you name it. I'm still hearing all of those critters and more on the audio V files. Just nothing that I deem as unknown, which means I'm tuned in to something, and I'm as sharp as ever, so stay tuned.